There are a few things I'm really, really, really passionate about in this world, and one of them is book reading. I may not be a rock star book reader who can eat 100 books for breakfast, but I try to read as much as I can whenever I can. And my perfect afternoon is really quite simple. Grab a Starbucks coffee and browse the YA section at my local Barnes & Noble. Yes, I am an adult and I still read YA. They're fun and I like them, sue me. So the fact that bookstores have been in danger for the last decade has been really troubling. The other day, I read an article about Barnes & Nobles being bought out by a huge hedge fund after a lot of fear that the largest bookstore chain in the United States was ready to collapse. Amazon has been undoubtedly brutal to the bookstore industry and it shows no real sign of slowing down. But with this purchase, the acting CEO is ready to make some sweeping changes to the bookstores and it's been really interesting for me to follow. The acting CEO is James Daunt, and he has a lot of credibility to his name. Similar to US bookstores, the UK bookstores have been in decline with the advance of Amazon and other online retailers. But James Daunt opened 60 bookshops, and every one of them was profitable, which makes him one of the most successful bookstores in the midst of the Amazon giant. He was credited with saving Waterstones, which is the likely UK equivalent to Barnes & Noble's in terms of large bookstore chains. And a lot of the changes he's making with Barnes & Noble's appears to be reminiscent of what he did to save Waterstones. From what the article says, he's going to do a complete overhaul, which I agree, needs to happen if Barnes & Noble has a chance of staying in business. One of the biggest things that Daunt is doing that I think will show the greatest result is allowing managers at different stores to determine what titles they want to promote more instead of letting the publishing companies dictate the shelf space. Yes, it was an initial hit to publishers because they aren't able to sell as much of what they think will sell, but they also don't know the regions as well as the people that live there do. This is again very true of what happens in elections and why we need leaders on both a local level and a higher level because the higher levels may not take into account what the needs are of that region and may be looking too widely at everything as a whole. This makes local leaders of that area very important to make decisions that will directly affect their constituents and make sure that their needs are being met. Even this breakdown of the top books per state varies greatly between genre and title. If it's up to the publishers to dictate what books they want to push, it's basically reverse marketing. Not to say that the publishers' choices are bad, but they aren't serving what the people want as much as they think the people will want on their shelves. And I'm glad the acting CEO understands this. I will come into the shop and go to G, and if it's there, I buy it, and if it's not, I walk out. Because frankly, you can do that on Amazon, you can do that on Waterstones.com. Uh, what you should be coming into a bookshop is to truly enjoy a period of time in it. It's Anyone that approaches the book business without the respect for books and just looks at the dollar sign is not going to do very well. From what I've read, Daunt seems to have a true respect for bookstores and I'm very glad for that. But beyond that, I want to offer an idea that may help Barnes & Nobles out even more. Of course, please take everything I say here with a grain of salt since I never have been a CEO or a manager of a thousand different stores. I am approaching this more as a consumer than anything else, but I do believe I have some instincts for business and I have a lot of love for books, so I don't want to see bookstores closing left, right, and center. Here's some backstory of myself so you know where I'm coming from. The way I perceive myself is that I am more of the average person in America who has a deep appreciation of books, but just not a lot of money for it. Other qualities that may or may not be important, you can be the judge. I'll just put them out there for your information. I am a first generation Asian American, female, in her 20s, grew up with the Harry Potter generation, there for the YA renaissance, currently writing a novel on the side, and my perfect birthday consists of me getting free Starbucks and browsing the Barnes & Nobles. Generally speaking, I don't have a lot of disposable income, so anything that I do buy, it's more of a must than a want. When I was a kid, I think I only bought two books from the bookstore, both of which were heavily discounted, which was the only reason why I was able to buy them in the first place. My parents just didn't have a lot of money and could not see the worth when there was a library we could go to for free every weekend. But there were always books at Barnes & Nobles I wanted to read that just never made it to the library. It's an unfortunate reality, but most people do not have the spending money to buy books that are $20 or $30 a piece. Every time I see an author complain about how people are not buying from Barnes & Nobles and buying on Amazon instead, I really have to bite my tongue not to say, well, Amazon is $5 cheaper. Yes, I'd love to support our stores, but we just can't ignore the fact that sometimes that has to come second when food and rent come first. Dollars here, pennies there, it all adds up. And Amazon not actually having to put the books physically for you and can determine how many books they can order of a certain kind have an advantage over bookstores because of that. My thought process is that access to reading should be a right, 
but buying books is a luxury. This is what I'm proposing so it doesn't feel like it has to be. In Asia, there are a huge number of cafes and bookstores that are there more as an activity than as a store. People come out to hang out these stores for the primary goal of reading and having either a beer or coffee with it as well. I'm basically pitching a reverse Starbucks. In Starbucks, it feels more like a work or study environment with laptops, headphones, briefcases being the norm. At Barnes & Nobles, you could adapt a more leisure ambiance where people are encouraged to stay as long as they like with a book being first, coffee second. Just look at this. If I have no particular plans on a weekend, I'd seriously consider spending my Saturday here, no question. In addition to selling books at the counter, Barnes & Nobles could also allow people to read the book as much as they want in store. People can browse without charge, of course do not take away the browsing option, but if anyone was truly interested in reading past the first few pages, they could take it up to the counter, pay a small reading fee, which might be something like a dollar an hour, and at the end of the day, if they want to purchase the book, they could for exactly what is listed on the jacket, and the in-store reading fee would be waived. We could call it going booking. Okay, that can be workshopped. But the idea is this. Let's treat the idea of visiting Barnes and Nobles as going to enjoy a leisurely activity instead of just going to the store with the sole purpose of buying something. The reason why this idea is so appealing to me is that, again, I don't have that much money to spare. If I'm gonna buy a full on book, I need to make sure that it's a book that I love and will revisit in the future. That's why these are the only books I bought full price all of which I've read at the library first to make sure I like them. And these ones are just books that friends gave me or were so cheap that I couldn't say no. I would buy more books if I could, I just can't. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of poor like that. But if you give me the option to read a new release right then and there for a small fee, I'd be more than happy to oblige. One of the biggest deterrents for me when I'm buying a book is that I think I'll love the book, but the book turns out to be utter garbage. And yes, this has happened a few times. I've gotten especially picky in my reading tastes since my teens, and it's gotten substantially worse since then. Sorry, unnamed book, I just can't. But if there's a book I really want to read and it only cost me a few dollars to try it out in a beautiful, welcoming lounge, I'd call that a well-spent Saturday. By the end of the year, I might have spent well over $200, depending on how many interesting titles are released, but for the amount that I've read, it would be a well-spent $200 in my eyes. And I wouldn't feel like I'm missing out on new releases or lamenting over purchased books I thought were gonna be great, but actually weren't. That's definitely 200 more dollars than Barnes & Nobles would have gotten from me in the first place. And providing a space like this for readers is not something an online retailer like Amazon can do. Here are some potential counter arguments I see coming. Aren't you just making Barnes & Nobles into a library, but with cost? Yes and no, bookstores are inherently different from the atmosphere that they give off and can often offer a lot larger selection of newer and more anticipated releases that some libraries may never see. It all goes into how Barnes & Noble structures its lounges and how accessible the coffee is. To which I say, a Barnes & Noble should always be connected to a coffee shop, which would help subsidize any month with low book sales. What if the person reads the entire book but doesn't buy it? If a person ends up reading the entire book within five hours, that would be $5, only a quarter of the actual price on the book, and you may think that authors, publishers, and bookstores would be losing out on that difference in revenue. This is a good argument to be had, and I think that's where money into market research needs to go. But I have a hunch that there are a lot of people out there like me who just can't afford to gamble on $20 to $30 a book we may or may not like. Many of these people won't even gamble on movies that are half that price and will wait for trusted reviewers to give their opinion on it first. And for books with such a small percentage of people out there reviewing them, it's even more difficult. To me, this could be an untapped oil well. You don't have stats on these people because these people aren't even going to show up in your list of rewards cards members because we don't even have that extra money to be a member in the first place. If you ask anyone why they own a book, an album, or a Blu-ray, usually the answer is the same. Unless it's a collector's item, they want it because they like that particular piece of art and want to keep it so they can revisit it sometime in the future. So I would wager that even if a person finished the book, they would buy it anyway, if they really liked it. If it was a meh, middle of the road type of book, they would put it back, no doubt. But here's another bonus to the system. Barnes & Nobles can take these results and bring them back to the publishers so that the publishers will have a better idea of what people are reading and what they want to see more or less of. 
This could be very useful data for publishers to find out which manuscripts they want to pick up next. I've seen way too many books that people think will be hits and the publishers push them like crazy only for them to fail because that's not what the market wanted. Some data points could be the duration the person held onto the book, did they finish it or not finish it, what was their reason for return, one to five star ratings, and of course, age, race, gender, and ethnicity. There is a huge number of people that don't go on to Goodreads after reading a book, but a store manager asking a reader this as they returned it will likely yield some response. As always, this will be optional. If a reader chooses not to disclose this information, that will always be the first priority. But I even said this about movies. If you want my information about my age, my sex, my ethnicity, please take it. If it helps you better understand that there are actual Asian Americans watching your movies or television shows, I'm all for putting my statistics out there. And so I hold the same outlook for books. Maybe I'm just trying to justify it, but movies and books are forms of entertainment and I want more of the good stuff. I don't get weirded out when Netflix recommends me other shows it thinks I'll like because I want it to do that. The reason I don't like it when Facebook does it is because I only go to Facebook for memes, not that broom I bought two days ago on an unrelated site. But by responding to that questionnaire, this is me as a reader stating, hey, this book's great. I actually want to support this author and any related works he or she may have. Positive results but no purchase says it's good but not evergreen quality. Positive response and purchase? That's what publishers want to see more of. This will help the manager know what books work best in their particular branch, and it circles back to the original decision that was made to put power back into the manager at their location. This may be a crazy idea because I know bookstores or even indie bookstores don't typically do this, but I know it's a tried and true method in other countries, and I think there would be a lot more benefits than there are detriments. Visiting a bookstore wouldn't feel so much as a luxury as it would be as an activity to do after school or on weekends. Of course, as the CEO understands, each region is different and it would be great to pilot test this at a few locations to see if the results are positive or negative. If you really are entertaining this idea, please put California first on your list. New York already has everything, California needs some love too. As much as I love indie bookstores, there is something comforting about the big chain bookstores that I find in both Northern California and Southern California. There's a reason why people will go to the big chains like Starbucks out of state, even if there is the local coffee shop, just because they know exactly what's on the menu and what to expect. I really don't want to see Barnes & Noble's fall like I watched Borders fall. Books serve a public good even if the number of book readers seems to be decreasing with the advent of more interactive technology. Everyone pretty much agrees that the fall of bookstores is tragic, but at the end of the day, it always comes down to the profitability as it does with any other business. If this entices less privileged readers to still read new books and provide a sense of activity, I think Barnes & Nobles could see an increase in revenue and it could encourage more reading in generations to come. Thank you so much for listening. Making this change will require a big investment from Barnes & Noble. So if you think this idea is something you would support, please share this video around. If enough people rally behind it, it may help to convince Barnes & Noble to try it out. Or alternatively, if you have any other ideas on how to improve the state of bookstores, please put them in the comments section down below. Like I came across this video about working in a bookstore and I think this comment for employees is also a really good one to take into account. Allow and encourage your employees to read books as long as they return them in brand new condition. Doing that would make your employees valuable curators of your stores and again, help to build that rapport between seller and customer. I would love to see if there's any other concerns that I didn't really touch on that could help improve their business. Because at the end of the day, I think we're all just trying to do the same thing and make sure the generations to come have access to books and we can foster their love of reading. Because at least for me personally, I know if my dad hadn't taken me to the library every weekend, I wouldn't be the book reader that I am today.